Imagine a world where vision is not just seen through the eyes, but through innovation and ingenuity. Today's conversation is with James Gilbert, a man whose sight was not just restored by medical marvels, but given new depth by artificial intelligence. AI has come such a long ways, man. Like when I was in college and I was going through going through this stuff, it was, it was this like 30 pound machine that sat on my lap. Once hindered by impaired vision, James harnessed the power of AI to not only excel academically, but also to become a creative force in the marketing world. And I know it helped me. I would not have gotten my college degree without AI. Like that's just the truth. James is a three-time CMO and recently stepped into the role of VP of Lead Gen at Bloomerang. James's experience is shaping the future of how we connect with audiences on a global scale. Like we just get stuck in ourselves and our own minds way too much. And it can provide that clarity. I, I genuinely believe that. And I think that's some of the future of marketing. Join us as James Gilbert unveils his transformative journey with AI, challenges our perceptions of technology and marketing, and offers a glimpse into the evolution of lead generation. Welcome to the podcast, James. I'm really excited to talk to you about everything in marketing and all the exciting changes uh, that have happened in 2023, especially how AI and automation has really taken over the marketing world. But before we dig into that, I really wanted to talk to you a little bit about your college experience. Uh, your journey with voice dictation um, mm -hmm. during college is pretty inspiring. How did your, how do you think overcoming those challenges influenced how you approach using technology today? Well, it's made me a lot more creative. Yeah, uh, you know, I think that you don't hear that very often where somebody is very number oriented, data driven, but also very creative. Um, I was, it, it forces your hand. So <clears throat> not being able to see things like you tap into other senses. And there was a little while there that I forgot. I just completely forgot what things looked like. Like it, you just lose, lose it after a while. Yeah, and, tell that story a little bit, like going into, because you, you were without your sight, your full sight for four years, right? Yeah, four years. Um, so I, I was on a transplant list for about four years, um, got my left cornea and then my right cornea, um, got both of those done. So now I can see good. So everyone always asks that question. I always forget to add that flavor in there. I can see good now. As a matter of fact, I, for the first time since we've lived down here in Southern Utah, I went and got an eye uh, exam for like, it's been a long time. Okay. And I, kn I started noticing like my right eye was getting a little bit bad and, you know, eventually 10 years from now, I'm probably going to have to have an, an, some more corneal transplants. It's just how it works. But interestingly enough, like my eyes have actually been getting better, like oddly, like progressively better. Um, even the doctors can't explain it. So it's, it's been kind of, kind of crazy. So this is actually the best I've ever seen is right now. Um, so with these new glasses and everything, I can actually see pretty well, even without my glasses now, which is pretty, pretty strange, but yeah, I, I leveraged AI before it became like a big thing. Uh, and I think a lot of the disability community, by the way, does. Uh, I think this is something that a lot of brands also forget about and something that I'm very passionate about. And that's just the accessibility aspect of our brands um, and websites, for that matter, are just oftentimes forgot about. It's put on the back burner or it's something that, you know, you don't put in your brand guidelines because, you know, you think that there's not that many people. But there are some real life statistics on this stuff and data behind this stuff. They show that the majority of the people in in a, ha in a household actually do have a disability and not having your website be accessible is something that actually impacts everybody within a household, not just those that are visually disabled. And I remember uh, when I was the CMO at Flip, we were running a podcast and uh, I had this gentleman on and he was a quadriplegic and he uses voice technology to do everything um, and uses it to order his food and do his grocery shopping. And it was one of the coolest conversations that I've had in a long time, just because AI has come such a long ways, man. Like when I was in college and I was going through, going through this stuff, it was, it was this like 30 pound machine that sat on my lap and 
I can't remember exactly how it worked because I couldn't see. So I was just feeling around, but it, it, it was like a, it felt like a really kind of like hot monitor and I'd put my book, in, put, put my book in it and it would actually read me my book or every time I type, it would dictate what I was typing. Um, so those kinds of things existed, but it was so clunky and you never expected it to get better. Uh, so when I went and worked for flip and did voice automation, it was something I just like fell in love with. Right. I, I, I think AI gets a bad rap, but it's also done incredible things for human beings and for us in general that like we, we say we're, we're a lot oftentimes like the notion of like, when we use AI, we're, we're becoming less human. And I actually would argue that that's not true. I think we're becoming more human and we're able to serve more people because AI allows us to do things that we've never been able to do. You're, you're absolutely right. Because when I was reading the story about what you had to go through, like having your classmates, you know, take your notes and then scan them in and have that, <laughs> you know, being read back. Like I could barely do that, go through college and take my own notes, let alone going through all the, um, those challenges. And now, you know, when I take a picture of my whiteboard and send it to chat GPT, it gives me a full plan on how to execute that. It's just quite amazing. Yeah. It's, it's, it's come such a long ways. I mean, even, even in the last, I would say six months, the iterations of like, uh, for example, mid journey have just gone wild. Like you could put in a prompt asking it, Hey, like show me, show me the, the next up and coming generation of, of, of basketball players that, you know, like that's just kind of something that I love, but like, show me the next up and coming <laughs> basketball player. And it would be like, it would show like a, a Jersey that like the number would be all skewed and messed up. And they may, they may be smiling and their teeth would be all messed up. That was the first version. And then second, third and fourth versions of this stuff. It's just so good. I do think that there's, naturally with AI and we talked a lot about this at flip too, Brad, but you know, I think that there's naturally guardrails that we have to create as human beings with, with AI um, in, in its training and making sure that like we're doing the right things f just for humanity in general. But I, I do generally believe that it is meant to help us. And I know it helped me. I would not have gotten my college degree without AI. Like that's just the truth. Um, or at least without voice dictation. And I think there's a few college students that would say now they wouldn't get their college <laughs> degree without AI. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's even more true. Like, yeah, like all the papers that are being written by AI now in chat GBT, yeah. who the heck knows? I know my, my, this is a true story. My son, he's 17 and he was like preparing for like a driver's test or something like that. It was some sort of test and he did the whole thing in chat GPT. And I was like, dude, you like, you can't do that. Like you're not learning anything by doing that. But yeah. I do think it's a genuine problem too. Like we got to put guard well, guard well around it. One thing that we ran into all the time at flip as an AI company w was the genuine fear that people have of, what's going to happen with my data and things like that. And I do think that that is a genuine concern um, for sure. But I think the more that we're able to use it as human beings, the more that we figure this stuff out. Right. And I think that there's still a genuine fear behind using it. You just in our mm -hmm. day to day um, for the sake of like people worrying that they're not going to have a job anymore. Like I know I had people on my team for a little while and I was like encouraging them to use chat GPT and they're like really great writers and they're like, ah, oh, no, I'm not using it. I'm not using it. And I'm like, okay, fine. You don't want to use it. Then that's totally fine. I respect that. So we would have these like ideation sessions and I'd be like, Hey, let's get in, let's get in a meeting. Let's just, let's decide what we're going to do for content for the next month. And we'd sit there for one, two hours trying to come up with ideas. And I'm, and, and I, purposefully did this. I went to chat GPT ahead of time and did it anyway. And I, to, I, th this was like my way of kind of selling it. Probably not the greatest lesson, by the way, if you're a leader, like maybe not do this, but I did it and it, it worked for me. But so I actually did the, did the prompt well ahead of the meeting and like all the ideas were not like spot on. They weren't like perfect, but I was like, 
it took us two hours to come up with four ideas where this came up with 15 in less than what, four seconds that it takes to like finish writing all of it. Mm -hmm. Um, and guess what? We could probably use at least nine of them. So it doubled the input in a fraction of the time. And even if we didn't use the final product of that, it, it gets rid of, like, I think one of the greatest things that AI is doing, especially for the writing world right now is getting rid of the, the brain blocks that we have as human beings. Like we just get stuck in ourselves and our own minds way too much. And it can provide that clarity. I, I genuinely believe that. And I think that's some of the future of marketing. We could talk more about that too, Brad. Yeah, I think, you know, when, when you boil it down, especially like in your post, you, you, you emphasize like the importance of storytelling. And I think, you know, brainstorming um, is how one of the ways that I use it the most is just give me 20 ideas about this. Give me, um, you know, connect these different uh, things. How can I give me a bunch of analogies so that I can help explain this concept to a non-technical user easier or, you know, better or you know, more understanding, uh, the, the, the things that it can do to help with those storytelling, how do you really see companies leveraging AI to craft great stories? I'll tell you how I wish they would use it. I think every, <laughs> okay. I think every B2B tech company in the entire world needs to go grab their homepage of their website, just grab all of the text and, Go drop it into chat GPT and say, I want you to write this like I'm a five-year-old. And guess what? The world's problems are solved just with that. <laughs> like, I truly think that there's, there's way too much complications that people make trying to create buzzwords, trying to make it SEO friendly. Here's the, here's the simple fact, folks. It does not matter if I don't understand it. And it doesn't matter to your user if they don't understand it. And so I think the simplicity of just simple messages is one of the hardest things we do as human beings. It's, it's so hard for everyone. Mm -hmm. Um, Simplifying a message, making it shorter, making it more relatable, uh, driven to a pain point. Those are all things that I think a lot of marketers struggle with. Businesses struggle with it. And that's one area that I think AI can help immediately is simplifying some of the things that exist and and, and taking really complex situations and even making them more relatable, right? Uh, Like if you're using like engineering software, it can be very, very complex. You have to speak an engineer's language. Well, guess what? No, you don't. And that's part of the problem is people think they have to speak the language of a really complex situation when in reality, most people that are going to be looking at those things just need it to be really simple um, and in a quick version. And then if they want the technicality side of that, provide the technicality side of that in a different format. So that's one way. It's a, that's really good advice. Because I mean, even going back to what you were saying about how you kind of you know, brought those brainstormed ideas, I think people put AI, you know, AI is just a tool. It's a tool that can help you brainstorm. It can help you do a lot of different things. It can help you tell better stories. And I think that uh, the same way that you kind of brought those ideas, I've done that with some of my clients. One of the things that I did, I have a persona architect GPT yeah. where I literally, you can put in the, 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 the website of the client and it will bring back what are its key value propositions, its persona, and what it was. And I was recently doing this with a client. And it wasn't what, well, that's not really you know what it is. I'm like, well, this is kind of what it thinks it is. So that's a way, you know, mirroring and seeing what your message, because when you're in the thick of it, you know all the nuances, you know everything. But having AI kind of give you that harsh reality that it may not be giving the message. That's, that's good advice. Oh man, you just hit on it. You just hit on something that I love right now. And that's summer, like the summarization that can happen with AI taking a lot of information, giving, giving it that information and then having it summarize it. And I think you're spot on. Like we don't, we oftentimes don't know where our blind spots are Uh, internally as organizations, 
this is oftentimes why people like will bring on external people just so that they can get an outside perspective because it's hard. It's hard. We get blinded by those things. And I love the fact that you mentioned this because I, I have also used this as a way to, um, like summarize really, really long documents. Like for example, if I, if I'm, if I'm a new employee, here's a hack that you can have as, as a, as a new employee, as an organization, like take, take as much information as you possibly can from the website and from sales conversations, the transcripts that happen, and then give it all the, to chat GBT and say, all right, now tell me about this in one sentence. Tell me about this in a single paragraph. Give me an elevator pitch. I can't tell you how many times I've now over the last 12 months, used this in messaging and positioning exercises with clients and even in my own organizations that I've been at full time where we've rehashed our messaging and positioning and got to a much better place in such a short period of time. Cause messaging and positioning exercises, you know, take, they can take a long time prior to prior to AI, they would take anywhere between six to 12 months, depending on how big your organization was. And I think some of also the future of AI that's going to happen is the summarization of data that can happen at scale. So giving it large sets of data and saying, Hey, like, give me the insights. You know, we have these BI tools that do incredible work for us, attribution tools that do this incredible work for us. But oftentimes we're missing that little piece that just gives us, Hey, here's the insight. Like I looked at this data and this is what I found. And that is oftentimes having to be done by humans and manual manipulation of the data. And I think AI is going to make that a lot easier. Now I know that there's needs to be guardrails around that stuff, but I think it's going to make it a lot easier. I, I already see this happening, especially with some of the clients that I work with around, you know, things that would never have been possible or being extremely hard to do. For instance, like analyzing all of the support tickets, like 50,000 support tickets for a client to find out where your knowledge gaps are, or if the knowledge was there and people are just not getting to your knowledge base, these types of you know, things would have, I mean, that, I mean, to, they would have laughed at you and said, Hey, can we go analyze all 50,000 of these support tickets and figure it? that wouldn't have happened. But these are the things that you're now seeing come into the marketplace. Yeah. That's how we developed our, I mean, I, I think I can say this. That's how like flip developed our intent signals with e-commerce and retail, right? Is we would do this like proof of concept We'd listen to a certain amount of calls. And then from there, we would, based on the data, like AI would tell us, hey, this is the most, these are the most common. And then we would develop their use cases against that. And I think that that's, that's a very common thing. I think AI is being leveraged in customer service more than probably about any area right now. Across the board, like chatbots, like on the phone, uh, kind of all over the place, even even like analyzing conversations that are happening and sentiment and NPS, I think it, that customer service is probably one area that I feel like is truly invested in AI. Still a lot of fear for PII data and things like that, but ultimately I think yeah. that that function does well. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, that's definitely one. I think, you know, but marketing is definitely a natural because I think a lot of people are like, well, you know, uh, chat GPT, you know, and AI just makes things up, right? Yeah. Like, well, you know, that is creativity, right? Like, obviously you don't want to make up things about your product and you want to give us some base facts about, Hey, these are the things that, you know, you want to have in the messaging, but it can help you brainstorm and that, you know, utilizing what it is good at, um, uh, I think is a great way. I think one of the things that really struck me was when you talked about, um, after you had, uh, you know, taken off the bandages, uh, yeah. and you, you, you stopped off at the, the side of the road. You mentioned the grains of road as like a significant detail, just uh, after like regaining your sight. And you talked about that and kind of like in marketing narratives, like around the details, how do you really see that? Um, you know, and especially how do you see the ability to really get into the details, uh, and personalize, uh, being improved, you know, um, it's interesting because my mom, bless her heart, 
was like my biggest biggest advocate when I was going through this stuff. She is the one that was driving me to the hospital and she was a home care nurse. So like, this was like her, her, she, she, this was like right up her alley and, and helping. Plus I was her son. So that, that matters. Um, but she's actually encouraged me since then to like, she was the reason why I actually eventually shared my story publicly. Um, and, and I hadn't for a lot of years, like 20 plus years, I had never shared this story publicly. Um, so like one thing I will say is there's a lot of people out there and what she encouraged me to do and sharing it was the idea of like, there's a lot of people that one can be inspired by these type of stories and, and two are, are silently suffering and don't say a word. And there's a lot of people within our very own organizations in business, within our homes that may silently suffer and don't even know it. And I think the more that we can share these stories, the better. Um, so when she like inspired me to share the story publicly, um, I've actually now like been contemplating writing a book about this very subject. Cause I think that this is something that I'm very passionate about. I love a lot of people that know me know that it's like a little bit of my MO to be very unconventional and creative in situations with marketing. But I think it helped early on in my career I got to be in the customer experience world, serving brands, helping them figure out customer experience. And I wish that every marketer could do that because I think we, we oftentimes forget how much every little detail matters to the experience. And I've like quoted this so many times in my, in my life, but I'm going to do it again. And the CEO of Disney. I always mess up his name, so I'm not even going to try, but you can look it up. You'll hear see this quote. <laughs> but he basically says, um, brand is the product of a thousand gestures. If you know Disney really well, like they make it smell good in the park. Like, you know, like they don't even let you see them take the trash out. And I think we can learn a lot. Whether you like them as a brand or not makes no difference that they know how to create good experiences. And when you look across the brands that are doing incredible work, it's those things. Like look at Lego, like your wall, right? Like everybody knows that they create incredible experiences. They digitize a physical product in video games, in fun movies that are entertaining they then take those young, younger generations and make them part of the creative process. I think that there are incredible examples of this. And in order for us to get to the point where I think we can do this at scale more often, um, I think we have to realize that every situation does matter in an interaction when a buyer is like there, your first impression matters more than ever. Um, and people don't put up with the BS that they put up once, like a long time ago. And so you have a fraction of the time to entertain them, to get their attention. You have a fraction of the time to wow them over. And you have a fraction of the time to not mess up. And I think that the overall customer experience that exists with a brand historically across businesses has been so disjointed because there has not been enough ownership across every function. Like, I think this is one of the key unlocks to a true and really strong GTM motion, by the way, is when every function of the business has a KPI that's tied to the customer experience. And I'm talking even sales. And I think that, you know, we all have bad experiences with sales and we all have like some bad experiences with customer service and support. And a lot of times it's because like we're totally disjointed on the full brand experience, but then marketing is disjointed in the sense because then they're also trying to convince the CEO of the value of brand and the value of marketing. And the reason why is because not everyone is aligned on the full experience. And when you get a CEO or a founder um, or a board that understands the importance of all those interactions, and things hum so much better across functions. And I think that that's part of the unlock. Like we, we put too much weight in a single function's hands to own that. And it needs to be spread out across the functions of a business. 
Yeah, I think the customer experience, you know, a lot of that usually sits on, especially B2B companies, like some customer support, customer success teams. Um, you know, you have marketing, you know, trying to promise the world, sales, selling them the world, engineers being like, what did you sell? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and right, uh, <clears throat> so, I mean, I think it is, I, I, I really truly also think that uh, in, in my experience that when product works with marketing, uh, you kind of see a lot of really good uh, uh, um, circular motions going there because you have, especially when you have marketers actually using your product. I know that's not always the case, but at least being able to know, you know, and using it and solving their needs. Um, what? Uh, so we, we're talking. So you talked about. Uh, people aren't falling for the same old stuff that that they yeah. used to. Um, kind of looking at this past year, what do you think um, is what has been the most affected marketing tactic that just was like, hey, before 2023, this was good, but now we just can't do it anymore <laughs> because it's just so easy for everyone to do. Oh, man. I'll tell you the one that I think has gotten really out of hand because of AI and that's SEO just because th this is not going to be new to anyone because there's a lot of people out there that talk about the same thing, but it's, it's just getting so saturated simply because people are creating just to create and be SEO friendly. And what I think we're going to see is a shift, right? We're going to see a shift in rankings and things like that, that Google is going to care about a little bit more and the authority that Google is going to care about a little bit more. It's not just going to be about volume. And I think there's a lot of brands that jumped on that bandwagon big time over the last six, 12 months and really focused on SEO and building out like a strategy across that. And I think that there's a right and wrong way to do it. And I think a lot of brands did it the wrong way. <laughs> And I think we're going to see it kind of scale back a little bit. And some of those tactics I don't think are going to work quite as well as they used to simply because of that. What, what about do you think you? some of the mistakes that they're making? Oh, you're not getting off the hook on this one, man. Like what, what about you? <laughs> well, I think that it's with SEO, I think you're, you're spot on. I think that Google has a very, very big problem on their hand uh, because when I, you can just, uh, you know, use chat GPT or I have one that, you know, searches the first page of Google and goes to, you know, and just does the quick glance for me to see what might be relevant and what might not be it. Yeah. Their business <laughs> model, uh, is, is in trouble. And then on the flip side of that, being able to pump out, you know, from, you know, this podcast, I could probably write an AI script that pumps out a hundred blog posts related to different yeah. topics. So topical authority is very easy uh, to maintain. I, I, I think that SEO, I also think that now the ability to create hyper-personalized, you know, emails is hard or, or I mean, I just oh, see yeah, that's a, good a one. flood, a flood of just emails just coming my way um, that, just get filtered out. So I think that, you know, these things that used to actually require someone to write something, put some thought into it. You know, I've, I've had a lot of emails where I've wrote myself where I'm like, wow, that's like really, really personal. <laughs> like, because <laughs> of what it knows from all the things that it knows from what I posted on LinkedIn, Twitter, everywhere else. Uh, like it knows what I'm talking about right now. So I'll I don't you, know what that, that means. I'll tell you what, though. I still think there's a ways. I, th I still think we're a little ways away. At least this is from my perspective. Like, I get hit up a lot on LinkedIn and things like that. And I get out and it, like really amazed at how like little research people are doing to feed maybe the AI model, right? And they're being very, very lazy about it. Like, for example, I flaunt all the time. Like, this is not a secret. It's on my, like, LinkedIn profile. It's on every social profile you'd find of me. I wear, like, this stuff all the time. Like, I'm a big Utah Jazz fan. And I'm a big Star Wars nerd. 
I mean, it's in like every video, I mean, you know, <laughs> so it's like, like, you can't miss this stuff. I, I, write it i put it down like if you search me like you're gonna find those things and i i'm seriously not kidding you over a 20 year career i have only had four people ever use those to their advantage four over a 20 year career and i've been sold to majority of that career been in like a leadership position at some point or another where i had some sort of buying authority or influence in the decision that's incredible to me. So the fact that like we are like really 12 months into this AI thing, like that, where it's growing and I'm still not seeing that stuff at the personalization that I think we could get to that to me is like, there's still a lot of room for improvement. And I think that we'll see that over the next couple of years, but I hear you. On I, the... I... <laughs> Uh, that that's those are the grains uh you know of the road that you're talking about i think that you know one of the things that excites me uh is you know when i was at optimizely one of the hardest things going back to ideation right we want to run a b tests on these two um marketing campaigns or these two ad campaigns uh or try out different landing page layouts and different you know symmetric messaging now to be able to come up with 20 different ideas and test them, of course, if you have the, the, the traffic is, is unprecedented. I think that that is, is really exciting. And then I think too, you know, another thing was personalization. Yeah. Like you, in order, I remember the biggest, the tool to do it was, it was uh, pretty straightforward, but every single client ran into the same roadblock. I need to create a different image, a different content. And if you're just doing it on, you know, hot, cold, you know, four different sections of the country, that's like eight different permutations. So, you know, those grow very quickly. Now you can have truly personalized content. Well, plus you can, you can use AI to, to crawl a lot now on the web, right? And when you can use AI to crawl massive amounts of inputs into a message, your output's going to be pretty great. Um, and I think that that's only going to get better in my mind. It's kind of like the, the journey of like mid journey and seeing like the amount of inputs that you can now give it. And the outcome that comes from it is like night and day difference. And, and so like, I think we're going to see that continually improve for sure. Um, you know, I, I, Brad, I did a terrible job at like, I guess it's the audience here, uh, a little bit of this story. So yeah, the backstory behind the grains of the road and, and this whole thing in college is I was, uh, <clears throat> in high school, I loved basketball. I was actually pretty decent at it and I wanted to play basketball and lost my eyesight. And so, um, had, had a couple of bad eye diseases waited on a transplant list, uh, and went to the first four years of college, um, blind and had to use voice technology to get through it. Got my bachelor's degree. I actually was going to be a civil engineer. Um, had to shift things a little bit, change my trajectory of what I wanted to do the rest of my life. But the first surgery that I had was my left cornea and my mom was taking me home that day. We were in um, Bountiful, Utah. And she pulls over on the side of the road. And if you're familiar with I-15, it's a pretty busy freeway. And she took the bandage off and she's like, hey, the doctor said you could open up your eye and see if you want. And so I opened up my eye and it was pretty gross looking. But I opened it up and the first thing I looked at was the road. And this is what Brad's referring to um, that I called the grains of the road because we forget the details. And I, and I think this is a very true life lesson with almost anything when when we see things and we're around things we forget the beauty of what they are and we forget the details that really make it beautiful um and the same concept goes for marketing i think like and the same concept goes for just about any other business um initiative is like the more that we're in front of it the more that we need to rely on an outside perspective and a fresh set of eyes to look at it and I know that like when I was going through this stuff, like one of the things I talk a lot about uh, and I, and I even speak about this quite often 
is how important the five senses are to true good business practices. Because if you do any like research on science behind this stuff, um, ultimately when one sense goes away, uh, the, the senses of others are heightened. This is a very true thing. I can tell you that because I couldn't play the piano and I learned how to play the piano. Um, I have no idea how I was able to do it. I can't read music, but I can certainly sit down and play most, most music on the piano just by ear. And this was the sense that was heightened for me. Um, I can also hear things in music that most people can't hear, uh, still to this day. And I have this weird thing where I can have a conversation with you, like, and you, you are focused like just on me, right? The whole idea of like not being able to multitask. And that's very true for most people, but for me, it's not as linear, I guess you could say. I can have a conversation with my wife and a conversation with somebody totally different. Okay. Or like I could be typing something and have a conversation with my wife and what I could be typing could be about this podcast, but I could have a conversation with her about something totally different and not make a single mistake. And this is like just some things that happen to our, our brains and the science behind it. This is why creativity, for example, when we go outside, is just heightened because our five senses are all activated at the same time. And when our five, the more we can activate the five senses, the more that memory comes into play and the more that we're going to remember those things and the more that creativity then flourishes. So like some CMOs that have done this inc an incredible job is like the CMO of MasterCard. He wrote a whole book on this kind of stuff about the five senses. And this is why like he try he, 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 uh, tested out like having a mat, uh, like a credit card that was ed edible, right? Um, those kinds of things like for MasterCard, this is why MasterCard, if you actually look, they're one of the few brands that actually has their own iTunes album. And I'm not kidding. It's their own album um, on iTunes. And the reason why I think brands are going to now start thinking about these things more and more is for one reason, uh, the more that AI is leveraged in these things and saturates certain parts of marketing, the more that the five senses are going to need to be activated for us to remember the brand. And this is what Disney does really well when you go to the Disneyland parks and the Disney World parks is they activate your five senses as often as they possibly can. And the more that you activate in a single moment, the better the memory is going to be. So in marketing, the best lesson we can learn is the more senses we can activate in a single moment, the more that they're going to remember you. And this is why TikTok is taken off with virality of music, dancing, um, people like doing stuff with food and all sorts of stuff. Like it, they, these are the things that I think are really going to matter to people um, long term and more and more. And the more the AI is used. Yeah, I, I think uh, I want to have your uh, wife on to see if it is uh, <laughs> truly uh, she she, without mistakes. She tests me on this every <laughs> single time, dude. I'm not kidding you. Like, even, And my kids like bust up laughing because like, I'll be doing something and she'll be talking to me. And she's like, did you even just listen to anything I said? And I'm like, oh, yeah, this is what you said. And I say it back word for word. And she's like, gosh, dang it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I also tested this with my yeah. previous team at flip. Um, like they wanted to see if I literally could do this. And sure enough, like I wrote an article and they were a witness in person. I wrote an article while I was having a conversation and holding a meeting with them. And yeah, there was like maybe a few little grammatical That's, errors, uh... but pretty impressive. I think that, uh, you know, you bring up a lot of really good points about activating the five different senses. And I think, you know, you know, at the, at the end of the day, you're trying to create that emotional connection. Mm -hmm. You talk a lot about that and, you know, how emotional connection and data. And one of the things that you founded, uh, or helped start a few, uh, uh, a few years ago was a, a B2B podcast called banking on experience. Mm -hmm. So from zero episodes, I think now there's 138 episodes, uh, what was that experience life like? And do you have any tips for uh, anyone maybe starting their journey, uh, you know, asking for a friend? <laughs> <laughs> well, Brad, what I can tell you is um, I've been lucky enough to host five different podcasts and create five over the course of my career. Me and my brother started the first one. This is like back when podcasts really weren't like big. 
This was like when Neil. Okay. Yeah. If you're a real OG in marketing, you're gonna know who I'm talking about. But this is when Neil Patel started becoming famous oh, yeah. for his podcast. If you yeah, ask the public, yeah. So he he hasn't. Yeah. He was like the like in my opinion one of the OG podcasters and became like really well known. And me and my brother started one called Marketing Cupcakes, and it was all based off of this um, theory uh, that we ran in our in our agency that we had at the time, where people would be completely blown away that we would show up in person with like frozen cupcakes. Uh, it sounds weird, but like that's, that was our primary business model. We would show up in person to their office um, and have frozen cupcakes and be like, Hey, like we, we want to meet with you and people were blown away by this. And so we started a podcast called marketing cupcakes talking about this story and just like how there's different ways and unconventional ways in which you can get the attention of people. And then we started a podcast in like not me, not we, but like I started a podcast for a company called cloud cherry called the suites of CX and Cisco consumed that one. Yeah. When we got acquired and then when I went to CRM next, we started banking on experience and the whole premise around banking on experience was, you know, that this was like during the pandemic um, and during all the craziness that was happening at that particular time both on a diversity perspective and just everything that was going on in the world was just crazy. And so we brought people on to talk about those subjects and the experiences that they're having in their lives. Um, but we also gave people a platform to have a voice. And I think, you know, the general premise of people wanting to do a podcast is, is that like highlighting people's voices but it's oftentimes not done in a very genuine way. You know what I mean? And I think this was some of the power that we had created with that podcast is the conversations that we would have with people were very, very real. They were open. Like me as a host, I didn't, <clears throat> I didn't try to like dictate a conversation and ask question after question. It was a true dialogue. And I think that's what people like in podcasts, right? Um, but we also leveraged the podcast, which I'm sure you do a lot, Brad. Um, we would ask very specific questions on each episode to do free market research. And I think that that's an unlock that people forget that they can use. <clears throat> so we did that a lot. And then we did one at, um, at Flip, too, that I was the host of. You're absolutely right. I mean, one of the biggest reasons I started this podcast is because I want to have these conversations about what people are doing in this new world of generative AI, you know, all of these new AI models, the rapid pace, because, you know, there's, it's just moving so quickly that, you know, one, my <laughs> friends and family are probably sick and tired of me talking about <laughs> it. So I was like, Hey, let's find, <laughs> let's find some other people that are excited about it. And and you're right. Like finding out, you know, what are people doing? What are, you know, the ways that people are utilizing this in their own um, experiences? Um, and then two, you know, especially now, since, you know, it's so easy to create you know, generated content, blogs, those types of things. People are looking for more uh, conversations like this that are genuine, that they're actually real people with real, <laughs> uh, you know, customer stories, real um, stories to tell from the trenches. Yeah. And it, listen, like AI has helped me a ton too, to be able to get to the point where I can feel confident, more confident about writing. Cause like, you know, <laughs> some of the most crucial moments of your life, for writing is in college. And unfortunately like that didn't work for me. So, um, it's made me a better writer. Yeah. It gives me framework that I can like pull from and it organizes my thoughts a little bit better, um, than maybe I have in my mind. Uh, so like, I think that's, that's something that has helped me. Like when I've been like writing the book that I'm working on, like that's something that's helped a ton too, is just like organizing the thoughts that I have and even like teaching it about who I am and telling it my stories and, and things like that, that have happened in my life. And then being like, okay, well, how, like, tell me how I come across, like what, what kind of sentiment am I giving? And is that the audience that I want to try to drive? I, I think your example there is spot on. Cause I do that 
with the book that I'm writing right now and it, it helps me a lot. <clears throat> so, yeah. Yeah. A brainstorming partner and a critic is, is really the main reason that or ways that I use, um, you know, chat GPT, um, to, to really analyze, summarize and, you know, see what I'm doing. I think that, you know, you, you mentioned, you know, just how, <clears throat> uh, it has helped with your writing. I never, uh, would write that much. I went for a computer science degree. We didn't have a lot of writing, a lot of writing code that was in C and languages that I don't use anymore, but, <laughs> uh, we, uh, we didn't get a lot of opportunities to write and throughout my career, whether it just be, you know, writing a blog post about what you did, uh, about this particular project, writing has been one of the best ways to get your story out there and to also organize your thoughts. And you're absolutely right. I've never, um, I, I feel like that is one area that I've definitely up leveled. And one of the things you talk about in your, uh, in your blog post as well too, is kind of hiring a diversity of talents. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned earlier about like job loss. Some people are like, Oh, it's going to take my job. But other people are like, what are the things that I maybe have never done before? You talk about how some of the best people that you've ever hired never had that particular skill before doing it. So how do you see, you know, this new rise and being able to you know, change what you're probably wasn't as good as, or how to up upskill your, um, your work? I don't know if I'm ever going to be able to convince the masses of the world that's listening <clears throat> to follow my lead here at all, <laughs> but I can't tell you how much it's been a win to not go off of the traditional method of hiring people because they have a great resume and they have good experience that looks like on paper. I can say without a shadow of a doubt that most, that some of the best marketers in their unique areas of expertise. Okay. Um, I would have never found if I went that way, like truthfully, uh, like I like one one person I'll give you an example uh was a was a fashion designer at a retail company like never had done b two b design ever did never had touched graphic design and he he is by far one of the best designers that I've ever hired like like by like a mile a minute <laughs> it's not even close and and here's why I think this is important like going through like the normal hiring process of what we go through, like we go through these checks, like check boxes. Oh, you got to have like 10 years of experience. You got to have like a X experience. You got to know this code if you're an engineer. And, and while I think that there's validity to that, there's also a massive amount of, of blinders that come with those things as well of things being done the way that they've always been done. And how you can't think out of the box. What I loved about this individual that became one of the best graphic designers that I've ever known in my whole life is he brought his illustrations to graphic design, which is very different, right? And doing something that's that's totally unique. Like you can't see it right now and I would get up and show you, but then it would cause problems with like the connection of the podcast. But that, that like <laughs> frame right there is actually a basketball that he drew um, and has my name on it or whatever. And, and it's like being palmed and he like, he drew it, but he would bring his illustrations to life in a lot of the design that we would do at flip and even CRM next. But I also had somebody who reviewed books on a YouTube channel and had never done video editing before, but had like enjoyed it. And so we gave her a chance to, to be like a video editor and she produced some of the best video that I've ever seen a B2B company do um, single-handedly by herself created majority of the videos that you would see at flip. And a lot of the videos that you'd see at CRM next. Um, another person that I think is one of the best marketers I've ever met in my whole life. And she's like followed me in almost every role that I've been in over the last like 10 years, <laughs> luckily. Cause she's amazing, but she, she didn't have marketing experience before she was a, 
professional dancer and actress. But I think this is again, why we oftentimes forget that like the, the skills that we have in these roles, they're, they're, they don't need to be looked at so linear. Um, like, as a matter of fact, I would go on, go on to say that that's one of the reasons why these people were so good at what they did. Cause they could think outside the box. They like the person that was a professional dancer and the actress, like an amazing storyteller, an amazing copywriter. Why they were doing it all day long. <laughs> they had to tell great stories through their acting. They had to master scripts, which is also copywriting. And we think that these skills can't be transferable all because they don't have industry knowledge. I would go to say that I think you need to actually hire people that don't have the industry knowledge so that they can think outside the box. Part of the reason why you may not be getting the, the attention that you're trying to get from customers today is because you're so focused on trying to do it the same way that it's always been done. And that I think is also like my big kind of like, I guess you could take this away from the podcast is, I think people need to be a lot more unconventional with everything that they do. Um, and it's, it's hard. It's hard to, to not be, not, not do the things the traditional way, but yeah. <laughs> I can echo from past experiences. I've had numerous startups and one of, and I think that's not just about marketers too. It, it transfers. It, it's all uh, skill sets. One of the best developers that I've ever worked with still work with, uh, when he got his first job at the company we we're working for was driving a cab and we gave him the pro, you know, uh, there was a little programming test that he had to, to do to kind of get the interview. And I saw it and I was like, wait, you, <laughs> I thought that one of my friends had given him the answers. Uh, but now I've worked with him at six different plate, you know, he's worked six different times. Uh, one of the best, uh, you know, developers out there. What do you think? you know, sets those, cause those are really hard people to find. How do you find those people? What do you, what do you think sets them apart? Because you're right. Skills don't really matter as much because when you have a box that, you know, an AI that you can ask pretty much the general knowledge of anything, what are you now looking for? To me, it's driven off of one thing and that's their passions and what they're really passionate about. Um, you know, I would say early on, my first CMO gig that I had, I, I didn't do this because I was like brand new, didn't really know what it was like to be a CMO. But after being a CMO now three different times and doing a lot of like fractional CMO stuff for a lot of other companies, one thing I have learned is it is so rare for a leader to simply ask, like, what do you love to do? And that may sound crazy, but I have spent a considerable amount of time with people in every one of my roles, at, like in one-on-ones asking this question. And I cannot tell you how many times I have found people doing what they're doing and absolutely hate it. And they're just doing it because it's the only way that they know how to provide for their families or provide for themselves. And I think that more people need to take that approach, one. And then number two, take the approach of providing them a pathway to actually like amplify their passions. And so in one-on-ones that I'd have with people, this is what I would do. I would ask them that question and I would f find developers who actually were really passionate about design and hated doing code. So we would move them to a designer and we would find designers that actually liked doing code and would rather do code. And we'd find copywriters that actually liked building ads and doing paid. So we would move them there. I think we have to provide the pathways for people, but also not be afraid to ask about what they're passionate about. Because if somebody is passionate about something, they figure it out. And that's the biggest unlock to almost any role that you're ever going to be in is when you're passionate enough about something, like you're going to stop at nothing to figure it out. And that you can't teach that. That's not a skill you can learn. It's just you're either passionate about it or you're not. Yeah, I um, one of the things that I do when interviewing uh, people uh, at, at my companies is is you know, teach me one thing, and that usually ends up being something that they're passionate about, something that I may not know, and then also to uh, 
something around asking questions, some sort of exercise around, you know, what questions do they ask? I think curiosity is one of the biggest skills that I look for in someone is not just passion, but a, but a curiosity and a passion to find the right answer to, um, to really do the research. So not to, to, to maybe question that. I like that common thinking. I like that a lot. Yeah. Um, so what do you, th- so one of the, you know, we talk about, you know, up leveling and skills. And one of the things that I'm really telling a lot of people that have never been in tech or never been, or like you said, a lot of people hate what they're doing right now. <laughs> they hate it. They think, oh, well, I'm going to have to like go back to college and get another four year degree to change my career or do whatever. I have people at my company that have never written a line of code in their life now doing scripts for migrations. We have, you know, who used to be executive assistant now doing design with AI image generation and now learning Photoshop through chat GPT. So if there's ever a time in history to think about a career change and doing something you really are passionate about and love, now's the time. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> I could not agree more. And, and by the way, you have more tools and technology and people that can support you in that than ever before too. Yeah. And especially if you're, if you're learning how these new tools uh, work, what they're capable of, what they're not, you're also even whether you go off and do your own thing or, you know, every company is looking for people that have expertise in these tools. The, the knowledge gap is, is real. Um, so, as we look towards 2024, what different kind of things would you, what kind of technologies, what kind of strategies should people be putting in place for their marketing efforts to really take, take advantage of all these new tools and all these new um, techniques that are bound to come out of 2024? Well, I think, um, I think, like there's a general rule of thumb that I always use, like crawl, walk, run, right? That's something everyone's kind of heard. Um, but I'm like a really big believer in it. Like, I think it's a philosophy. I think it's a mindset that like don't try to boil the ocean. And I think everyone's trying to boil the ocean right now with AI and, and like, it's okay to take baby steps and learn a little optimize, learn a little optimize, um, tell you run. And, but I think that everybody, in a business environment needs to at least be walking right now or at least crawling with AI or they're going to be left behind. Um, and I think that it's not going to be like, all right, what's, are you the right talent? It's going to be, are you the right talent? And are you leveraging AI to be more efficient? Um, that's, I think going to be a general rule of thumb of how people are going to hire, um, how they're going to think about like you as a strategic leader, if you're going to be thinking about those things and how you're going to be more efficient. So, but I I genuinely believe like there's so many people that are trying to boil the ocean with it and trying to do everything or nothing at all. And I think you got to be just working your way into it. Crawl, walk, run. Yeah, definitely can't keep your head in the sand. Uh, It's not going away. It's, uh, you know, I think that you, I think crawl, walk, run is a good analogy. Uh, what would you say if someone isn't even crawling yet to like, just like start dipping their toes and to just see what it's capable of? Well, one, I would say the likelihood of you probably not doing it is out of fear and know that many of us who have played around with it had the same fear or some level of fear that might be somewhat equal to what you're thinking. And what I would say is like, just try, just try it. Um, like dip your fingers in it at least and see where it can make you more efficient. And I would also say like, find somebody who can do it with you because there's a lot of people out there that, that they get very overwhelmed by, Oh my gosh, I have to be like a prompt genius and things like that. Right. Like uh, there's plenty of people out there that have now used it enough to where have them sit with you for 15 minutes 
and help you be more efficient in your own process, your own job, your own skills, whatever you're doing today. Um, and then, and then put your own flavor to it. I think that like uh, people forget that there's an unlock there with having other people, um, help you along the way. Yeah, I think, I think too, how you use it is a really good, uh, metric, uh, for how you interact with, um, other people too. I think, well, one of the things that's really helped me is, you know, when you say, oh, you have to be a master prompter. Well, when you're telling an AI to do something, I found that actually it's made me more clear on what I'm having my employees do. It's <laughs> made, made me be a lot more specific because uh, it's very similar to, you know, if I give very general instructions or general things, I'm not always going to get back what I want. Now, you know, obviously you want to, you know, and this is where the, the, the creativity and the brainstorming, you want your employees to brainstorm and be creative, but you still want to have like, Hey, this is what I'm expecting. Um, it's been very interesting to see this 2023 become more like, um, the better getting at AI, the better it's actually been as being a manager because you're kind of managing, uh, different agents or managing different, um, uh, uh, tasks that generally would have taken up a lot of your time. Like you said, two hours to brainstorm four ideas when now you can get that in four seconds. Yeah. I mean, I, I tend to agree with you too, because like there's just so, there's so much information out there too. Like, you can learn so much. There's templates out there. There are people that have literally built like lines of code to make this easier for you built products. Like <clears throat> we've we're like, what I will say is I think that there, there are going to be a lot of companies in the near future that are going, going to fail uh, as bad as that sounds just simply from the saturation of what exists from a technology perspective. And now it's easier than ever to create lookalike things that do just as much, if not like 90% there and have it baked under the same roof that a client may already have. And, and so I, I do think that like, oh, there's a lot of businesses out there that are going to have a lot of challenges with that piece. Um, like, like, you being a marketer, like, like I am, like you can look at the MarTech um, visual now and it's so massive that you literally can't even see a single logo. Uh, even if you can see really well, <laughs> you know, I know you're enjoying that conversation, but unfortunately we had some technical difficulties towards the end that cut off the last part of the conversation. So I'll have James back again so we can continue to talk about how AI is shaping the marketing world. Thanks for listening.